live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello everyone, this is Fox 12 Now. Thank you for joining us today. There is a live shot of Willamette Valley Vineyards down there just outside of Salem. It looks pretty nice out there. I'm going to guess there's going to be some people drinking some wine out there pretty soon. And thank you again for joining us. We are live here every weekday starting at 1 p.m. And of course going through the afternoon, we are live streaming on Facebook, YouTube, our website, and our apps. So lots of places to find the show and also watch those segments after they air. Like yesterday when we interviewed Ice Cube. Today we're talking about Wine and bees. Yes, it's an interesting combination. So this is something that we heard about from Willamette Valley Vineyards, where they're going to be having some tours where you can go out and learn about their mason bee program. Now, mason bees are native to Oregon, and this is a specific kind of bee that's native to the, the Willamette Valley that's very important for the wineries to make sure that when they're growing their grapes that everything goes according to plan. So what we wanted to do was actually go out to their uh, Willamette Domain location, or Domain Willamette location, which is down outside of Dayton, and, uh, and actually talk to one of their beekeepers, their bee guy, if you will, and that is Stephen Paisley. So this first part of the interview that you're gonna be seeing here is actually us out there talking to them about the bee houses and how this all works. And it's actually is something that's very specific here to the Willamette Valley. So, so it's very specific locally and something that uh, we found pretty fascinating. So let's go ahead and do this. This is us out in the field at this location, literally out in the field, uh, talking to Stephen, the bee guy. Thank you, here we are out, I mean, obviously with the beautiful wine here behind us, uh, the winery. Um, tell us just a little bit about yourself here to start off and what it is that we're gonna be doing here today. Okay, uh, I'm a retired electrician. I ran a service truck for a long time and retired. And before I retired, uh, my wife and I went up to uh, Hillsboro to the Jackson Bottom Wetlands. Uh -huh. And there was a man looking at a bee house like this. And that was about eight or nine years ago. And since then I've been uh, raising Mason bees. Raising mason bees, raising bees. just hand raising, hand yeah. raising bees. So this is what we're looking at right here. So this is a bee house. There's a bee house. Okay. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put trays in here. Okay. And they're gonna be channels because mason bees are cavity bees. They they go into, they find cavities. They'll find a, okay. a log with a hole. From the, but we're giving them a whole bunch of cavities. Okay. And so they're gonna nest in here. They'll lay their eggs. They'll, they'll become cocoons and then they'll emerge. And so tell me about that. Like how important is it to have these bees out here for the ah, vineyard? That's a good question. Did you know that vineyards are monoculture? No. They don't need pollination. Really? They're self-pollinating. Grapes are, most, most nut grapes are self-pollinating. So wineries don't need mason bees. Okay. But being good um, keepers of the environment, by introducing mason bees, other bee, other insects that are good for the vineyards come. There are parasitic uh, wasps and other kind of parasites that will eat the insects that are bad for the grapes. So by introducing mason bees, the babies of those mason bees will eat my mason bees, but but the other parasites are good for it. Will will eat. You know the bad things for the vineyard. So this is all because the mason bees are introduced. Yeah. Everything else is going to start showing up here. The yes. stuff that's good for yes. it will get rid of the bad stuff. So it really is part of this whole ecosystem. Yeah. That's what's really cool is the first couple of years we didn't see any parasitic wasps, and I thought that was really cool. So why are parasitic wasps good? Parasitic wasps, who lay their eggs in our cocoons, which is bad, their adults eat. Uh, uh, mealy worms and some of the kind of moth, which are bad for the vineyard. Okay, so the mason bees are a little bit of a sacrificial way of in part of part of it. Yeah, there. Okay. We, we, give, we give up some, but we get a lot. That's great. Okay, and mason bees. Th tell me about the specific kind of mason bee we're going to be taking a look at, because this is native to Oregon, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. We're dealing mostly with the blue orchard. Okay. Bee. And they they like the orchards. They they do, you know, and with the pollinators. Did you know the mason bees are one of four uh, species of bee pollinators that the state of Oregon has that are managed? Okay. Obviously the honeybees, mason bees, leaf cutting bees, and alkali bees are okay. all managed. And managed means in the winter, we keep them in the cooler so they have a steady temperature 
and, and their metabolism stays consistent, and we bring them out when we want them out. If they'd been, in, if they'd been out in nature, they would have come out a couple weeks ago when it was really warm, Yeah. but the temperature dropped, Yeah. and maybe the males had come out and the females didn't come out and the males may have died okay. before the females come out. So by managing them, we can we know now the temperature is going to be right for them the rest of the season. Okay. And that, the other the other management we do is in the fall in November we'll remove all the all the trays that are full of cocoons, remove them remove them out of the channels, clean the cocoons and store them, clean the channels and put them in storage until now. Until now, until now is when you bring them back out. Yeah, so those is, are our two managing seasons. And other people who work with mason bees around the entire valley are doing the same thing right now. Yep. Bringing the bees out. What do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions people have about mason bees? They think they're a fly. They look yeah. like, a, like a large blue fly. Okay. And people, and because they're, unlike a honeybee, wasp, or hornet, they're, they're solitary. They're not social. So you can stand here when they're active and just stand right here and be covered with a hundred bees and they don't care about you. I don't you. want to do that. <laughs> they're, not, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna bother you because they're concerned about this. Okay. They don't, they don't have a queen. All the, all the females are queens. Okay. They're all royalty. Not like a hive where there's one queen. They're, they're all okay. royalty. How does it feel for you to be a part of this, you know, eight or nine years now to come out here and help contribute these bees and be a part of this you know the ecosystem in the valley. Oh, it's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> I get to tell people about them, and I, and they just keep growing, and you know, and so we only have room for 1,200 bees to nest okay. in all of our complex, and we're going to put over 10,000 cocoons out. So that means 9,000 aren't going to. Well, you have to deduct the males, depending okay. on depending on the season. You'll have a quarter to a half are male. If they have, if if the, if the bee is having a good season, she'll have very few males. If she's having a bad season, she'll produce a lot more males, and you won't have as many females. Okay. So if you take the if we take the worst scenario, ten thousand, we have five thousand, and we only have room for for fifteen hundred. So three thirty three thousand the fittest out here are going to go out and continue to propagate. That's great. So helping to continue continue along that species here in the valley. Yeah. Well, I am, um, I think, let's take a look at how this all works. All right. And get some bees in there. Yep. These are adult mason bees. This large one so there's a bee in there. There's a bee. Put your hand out. That's a, that is a female. How do you know the difference? Well, I'll tell you in just a second. <laughs> That's a male. All right. So obviously smaller. The yes. Smaller the female. There's another female. And this. So these have been in the refrigerator essentially. Yep. There's another guy. And within there is a live bee. Yep, a live bee. If we cut that open, if we cut that open today, she would emerge and fly on out, or he would emerge and fly out. They've already hatched. They hatched last May, and then they became a, a larva for a month, and then a pupa for about a month. And at the end of that month, it spun the cocoon, and for the other eight months, it just lived in that cocoon. They are excited about it being 55 degrees. So I just dump them back? Yep. All right. And so let's see how you place them in there. Very, just open the box and set them in. It's that simple. That simple. You know. And then when they emerge, they're going to see all these holes right here. Yep. And they're going to know, okay, that's a place. This is a great go. place to live. This is a great neighborhood. Mason bees need four things. They need 55 degrees. They need a building site. They need food. They need pollen, nectar, and water. And they need building material. 
the mud. They're mason bees for a reason. And so that's why you've dug a hole right there? That's why we've dug holes. Okay, and we'll get a picture of that too. But um, So that way they're going to fly out, they're going to see that mud, they're going to grab the mud, bring it back here. Yep. And so it goes. How long until they emerge? The males will start emerging within probably 48 hours. Okay. And then the females will emerge maybe a week later. So by April 1st, this place should start to really be booming around. All right, so taking a look there again, you know, just at how that all works out, a native species there with that mason bee in particular. So from there, um, also really quick too, a big thank you to the Oregon Bee Project for helping share some of that footage of the bees actually after they they are uh, out and flying around, so really appreciate them. And speaking of them, they are going to be out there at Willamette Valley Vineyards for you to meet and go on a tour to see how all, all of this works and to try out the wines in particular. So that, that uh, you know, are taking advantage of the bees being out there and making sure that everything's growing correctly. So that's what we're going to be talking about next. We have Jet Rainwater, who is head of biodynamics for uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards. And... She joined us to talk about um, just the processes that they go through, including how they use the lunar cycle to decide when and how to harvest their wine to make it. They explain it much better than me. Let's go ahead and do this here. We'll have Jet on right now. Jet Rainwater. I am a winery ambassador uh, here at Domain Willamette. I'm also our biodynamic ambassador. Biodynamic uh, ambassador. Can yeah. you explain what that is? Yeah, so this uh, facility, we are biodynamically farmed. Um, so it is a kind of a, a fairly new idea. Uh, started in the early 1900s, uh, but it's really a combination of um, you know, these dynamic systems and our uh, biological activity. So making sure that we are working with the natural rhythms that we have instead of against them. Okay. Uh, so we farm according to the lunar cycles. Wow. Okay. So according to the lunar cycles, and does this tie in as well with like having the mason bees out here and, yes. and tying into uh, that? You yeah. Know. A big part of biodynamics is having um, biodiversity on site. So, you know, the mason bees bringing in kind of those predatory wasps that uh, Stephen mm -hmm. was talking about is kind of a perfect segue into biodynamics. Uh, so we have about 24% of the property currently set aside just to bring in that diversity. And so with something that unique, you know, when we're talking about the Willamette Valley and just here and, and bringing in natural, you know, local species of, of insects, yeah. um, does that tie into what you produce with the wine? Yes, okay. um, you know, because our farming practices are a little different, uh, we also have the opportunity to make our wines a little different. Uh, so actually the Brno Estate Pinot Noir, which is one of the wines we'll be featuring on this bee tour, uh, is, you know, in the process of being a fully biodynamically produced wine. So uh, we're very excited. This would be the first one for us as a company uh, since we you know, officially got our uh, Demeter certification in December. Okay, then can you explain that just a little bit more because I think this is really interesting. So yeah. you, you farm according <laughs> to the lunar cycle, mm -hmm. you've got the mason bees, and this is all ties into that biodynamic. Yes. Yeah, wow. all That's you know, insane. working what, with what we naturally have yeah. instead of having to you know, kind of create it out of nothing. Okay. Um, so biodynamically produced wine is going to be all indigenous yeast, so we're not inoculating with anything. Uh, we're also not adding things like tannin or acid. Uh, so it's So this very is all nerdy. just really yeah. is, yeah, very, <laughs> very natural. And when you do have that, you know, you know when the, you produce the wine, what are some of the main things that people will notice yeah, from that? Um, it's just clean. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing kind of funky coming out at you. Uh, but we do get a nice roundness that you don't really see on some, you know, normally produced wines. So a little more kind of an earthy backing uh, texture on the palate as well. Okay, all right. And we've got the Pinot Noir right there. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then we're also taking a look here. These yeah, are some so um, during these bee tours, uh, yes. we'll actually start out in the pavilion. Okay. Uh, you'll be with one of our winery ambassadors that will take you through our tour route uh, where we'll stop and talk with some um, bee guys uh, from <laughs> Oregon Bee Project that will be here. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so we'll start with our Brut, um, which is a blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, then we'll go on to our Brut Rosé, which is 97% Pinot, which is a tiny bit of Chardonnay in there. Uh, and then we'll move on to two single, visor, uh, single vineyard designate uh, Pinot Noirs that both have mason bees on property. And all, yeah, tying back to those bees. And so, again, talking about this, this event coming up, so the, you being the bee ambassador, what goes into being a bee ambassador, by the way? 
It's a lot of just research. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it has been a really fun time. I get to work with our vineyard team pretty closely. Um, so kind of expanding what we're doing on this property to be as sustainable as possible. And for the, for the tour itself, when people come out here, mm -hmm. so you walked through a little bit of, of what it was, but when is it and, and how is it everybody can get Yeah, so April 27th, okay. um, tours leave on the hour, uh, starting at 11 o'clock. Okay. So we'll do groups of about eight. We'll go off with a winery ambassador to kind of go through the steps, drink some wine along the way, uh, and then we'll actually end downstairs in our cellar uh, with a honey-themed cheese board. Ah, oh, fantastic. I mean, who doesn't like that? Honey-themed exactly. cheese and <laughs> wine, and all tied into this biodynamic idea that's really bringing it here for the, for the Willamette Valley and exactly. bringing everything that it offers yeah. into the wine. Well, thank you so much. This, is, this is fantastic. Really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming it. out today. All right, so again, thank you to Jet there for explaining all of that and really interesting using the lunar cycle, so something that's pretty unique out there in addition to having those mason bees, which are used throughout the Willamette Valley and, uh, you know, a native Oregon species that's uh, really helping out. So interesting for that. Thank you for uh, them for having us out, and thank you to all of you for watching. Again, this is Fox 12 Now. We live stream here every weekday, and we cover a huge wide range of topics on this show, so you can watch all of those via the Fox 12 Oregon app or the website or you know Facebook and YouTube as well. They do show up there uh, also. So that may be where you're watching us right now. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back at 1.30 p.m. We're gonna switch gears. We're gonna talk to the local, uh, local person, Dave uh, Trayathon, who used to be the VP of marketing for Mountain Meadows, now working for a nonprofit called the Well Done Foundation. And they have a new children's book out. That's a whole lot of words I just threw at you. So we're gonna explain a little bit better when he joins us. But basically it's a book learning about how there's apparently thousands of uncapped wells that uh, are all over the United States and they're contributing to some climate change, to some issues, so they need to be capped. So we're going to learn about that together coming up at 1.30 p.m. So just come right back here, whatever platform you're on, I will be here. I'll talk to you then. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.